In comparing the eating habits of the past to those of today, we can observe that people are no longer treating their bodies to the best foods available. We eat overly processed foods. For example, many of the cereal grains have been bred for higher yields, larger kernels, or a better color when roasted. To introduce modern consumers with food that is as good for their bodies as it is delicious, Purity Foods, located in Okemos, Michigan, produces products made from spelt grain. Spelt dates back more than 9,000 years. In fact, an 11th century mystic named Hildegard of Bingen use spelt as the main ingredient in potions used in different cures. First domesticated in the cradle of civilization, the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley, spelt is referenced in various parts of the Bible. Only three grains in the Triticum genus have a hull that does not come off in the combine and spelt is one of them. Because of this, it makes it more costly to transport and requires more steps in processing. During World War II, that's why German farmers were forbidden to grow spelt, but some of them grew it in isolated fields anyway because they loved its taste and health-giving qualities. Spelt has miraculously survived, and the grain is flourishing again as people look for healthier alternatives to wheat and other grains. Europeans have come to accept spelt as a gourmet grain, and it is found in hundreds of gourmet baked items. Our company established a market for spelt 20 years ago, and we remain the large supplier of spelt in the United States. Spelt has endless health benefits, much more than wheat or other grains. As a natural grain, it contains all eight essential amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein that are not made by our bodies like other 13 amino acids. Its legendary ease of digestion is a quality that allows the body to absorb all the nutrients from the grain. Many people with digestive disorders, wheat allergies, and sensitivities can only tolerate the gentle spelt grain. Because it is so easy to digest and the proteins are hydrolyzed or broken down into their components much faster. Spelt is a good source of complex carbohydrates, dietary fiber, and potassium, as well as B vitamins. When its legendary ease of digestion is coupled with a source of major nutrients, it makes spelt a formidable food and that all the nutrients are digested and made available to be assimilated into the body. Many other foods have the nutrients, but are not bioavailable in the digestive process. Belt contains special carbohydrates, which play a decisive role in blood clotting and stimulates the body's immune system for an increased resistance to infection and speedier healing. The grain also delivers great results for people suffering from chronic diseases, such as diabetes, arthritis, Crohn's disease, food allergies, and sensitivities. We originally started to produce spelt because we heard from many chronically ill people expressing a need for the grain. It is also a favorite of endurance athletes. Well, many endurance athletes turn to spelt for quality carbohydrates, just as bodybuilders eat our products to help them with a quick recovery from injury or fast rebounding of muscle tissue. The whole spelt flour provides a continuous source of energy without the highs and lows so often experienced when consuming simple sugars. Spelt grains can be grown without any fertilizers, herbicides, or insecticides and require minimum inputs. It also grows well in a wide range of climates and soil types. Vita Spelt whole grain pastas contain 100% of the bran, germ, and endosperm that make up each and every kernel. The grains are tested when they come into the facility to make sure they are of the highest quality. To preserve the natural goodness of the grain, the company stores the kernel in the hull until it is ready to be used. The hull uniquely guards the kernel from air pollutants and pests. Our whole spelt flour is milled on one of the largest capacity mills in the organic food industry. We also have a white flour mill that produces white spelt flour for artisan breads and pie crusts. Vita spelt is adaptable in that the spelt flours can be easily substituted for the primary ingredients. Spelt flour often replaces wheat with very little change in appearance or volume and oftentimes outperforms wheat in the areas of flexibility, texture, and taste. The possibilities for cooking with spelt are endless, with delicious results from waffles and muffins to stuffing and casseroles. And recipes for spelt are considered easy to develop because spelt can replace any grain, including rice. Hello, welcome to this new episode of Elfco TV. We're here at Red Haven to talk to you a little bit about spelt. Um, I'm Tori Santucci, and I'm here with Don Sintrom, president of Purity Foods, makers of nature's legacy and Vita Spelt.
Thanks, Dory, for inviting me. Don, can you tell me a little bit about Purity Foods and how you got started in the spelt business? The previous owner, Willie Kosnopel, his last name is now Cole, actually uh, started the company about in 1979. And what we were doing at that particular time was selling bulk commodities to Europe in uh, container lots. And then one of the customers over in Europe um, saw a spike in the increase of spelt dink dinkle in German sales and then asked Willie if we could grow some here in the States. And we got the seed from Europe and planted it. And um, that's how it got started. And the strange thing about it was it was basically production for European consumption. And what really happened was a lot of naturopaths, um, a lot of people who had allergies, they heard about it, that we were growing it. And so they started asking how they could buy it. And so we recognized there could really be a market for it. And so that's how we began actually marketing it in the United States. The thing with Spelt though, okay, wheat gluten breaks down, according to the American Institute of Bakers, it breaks down in acid and in alcohol. Spelt breaks down in water, heat, and mixing. If I'm gonna cook this angel hair spaghetti, it's three to four minutes to yeah. get it done for you know regular spaghetti, five to six minutes, where when I'm looking at your traditional wheat pasta, it's gonna take a lot longer for it to cook. So, you know, based on what you've said about spelt, the gluten breaking down quicker, you can tell that when you cook this, it's fast, and that's because it doesn't take so long for the heat to break down the gluten content and for you to get um, a perfect al dente product. Um, and then also I've noticed by trying the new Nature's Legacy pasta that has omega-3 added to it that the cook time is actually a little bit longer. Because yeah, it's you have almost some more longer. Yeah. Yeah, you have more of the binding um, from the flax in there. Right. Um, so it just, that added to the spelt takes longer to cook down, but still I'm able to cook that pasta just as fast, if not faster, than your traditional wheat pasta. Right, yeah, it's still under 12 minutes. Right, but you know, that was surprising to me when we, when we were creating that our product, we thought, okay, well, it's gonna cook in four and a half to five minutes, just like all the other whole grain pasta that we do. But I said, no, let's see what it really does. And so we were all surprised that it actually took nearly nine minutes to cook the one with the flax. There's only 1% additional flax to it. So just that additional product, that binder, actually slows down the process. And I think if we equate that with digestion, it also slows down the digestive process as well. And that's what's so unique about Spelt. It rapidly breaks down into the component amino acids, just like our bodies want it to do. A lot of people are familiar with them. Um... Dr. Davies book, Wheat Belly, and how he kind of preaches the message that the wheat that we're eating today is far different from the wheat that, you know, our grandparents ate 50 years ago. And, you know, with that, you know, we're, we're seeing wheat put in things that it was never put in in the past, you know, as an additive. And on top of that, we're seeing consumption of wheat increasing, that the wheat crop today is different from the wheat crop 50 years ago where, you know, spelt is an ancient grain. The DNA makeup of spelt is the same today, you know, as it was 2,000 years ago, as it was 4,000 years ago. Why have farmers moved away from, you know, your traditional ancient grains when we know, you know, based on the research done, that people's bodies aren't handling it as well? Why are we eating an inferior product? Why are we growing an inferior product? Well, the traditional ancient grains that we recognize as ancient grains, a lot of people weren't exposed to those. Um, amaranth comes from uh, like South Central Mexico. Uh, quinoa comes from the Andes. Uh, and I, I understand today that uh, quinoa is so popular that the people in Peru can't eat quinoa anymore because they can't afford to pay the price to eat it because it was a, more of a common uh, food for them because now it's all getting exported. Um, so if we look at the grains that are heritage grains, um, 
if we look at sorghum, uh, that orig originates from Africa. If you look at teff, that comes from Ethiopia. A lot of these ancient grains were what those ancient people subsisted on, but they weren't available to everyone in the, in the world. Why have we moved into a situation where we're eating foods that really don't digest well, and people are having problems with them? Um, I think we can go back to well-meaning people who are concerned about our population. Uh, back in 1948, um, the Rockefeller Foundation enlisted the help of uh, a scientist. I believe at that time he was working for the University of Minnesota. His name was Norman Borlaug. And um, they wanted him to look at creating a high-yielding rice and high-yielding wheat. He looked at ways to be able to increase yield um, that were pretty simple. Um, wheat stood four and a half to six feet high. When a thunderstorm would come through, especially as the wheat matured and the stalks, uh, the nutrients were no longer coming up the stalk and was ready to be harvested, uh, a thunderstorm would come through and blow the wheat down. It would sprout. The farmer lost all of that wheat. Uh, there were uh, diseases like rust or scab that uh, took some of the yield away. So he addressed those kinds of issues, kind of simple issues. You know, it's like, how do I stop it from blowing down? Well, I'm going to get a semi-dwarf variety. I'm going to create a semi-dwarf variety so the wheat is only two feet tall and the stalk is stronger so it doesn't blow down. How do I create this uh, variety that is resistant to disease. So he did it in a logical manner. Um, unfortunately, uh, business got involved and they saw a profit in it, the seed companies. And so from 1960 to the year 2000, between land-grant universities and uh, private enterprise, 34,000 varieties of high yielding wheat were created and the driving force was I want more yield. The strange thing about it is although there is no GMO wheat that has been released for growing in the United States there is GMO wheat but it's on a shelf because they're because they do create these GMOs they have the same argument that they had back in 1948 with Norman Borlaug. Their concern is we have to feed the burgeoning population of the world, and so that's why we have GMO grains. The GMO grains, unfortunately, take more fertilizer, just like the hybrids, and they take more water. And what we've seen with the hybrid varieties is they really don't yield that well. So. And they, they're starting to see that with GMO corn. It doesn't yield as well as it, it professed it to yield when it first came out. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, the other problem with it is um, a lot of farmers who are growing GMOs are getting away from rotation. They're monocropping. They'll grow corn on the same acreage year after year after year, or they'll, they'll do a slight rotation where they'll rotate it out with soybeans. The reason why? An acre of corn at uh, $7 a bushel yields them around $900 an acre. At $14.90 a bushel, 40 bushel soybeans is $588. Wheat, on the other hand, at uh, almost 14 cents a pound, which is uh, $8.24 a bushel, returns them $379 a bushel per an acre. So what happens is when you've got $379 an acre versus $588 an acre versus $911 an acre, the farmer wants to plant that product that returns the most amount of money. Corn is that product. Secondly is soybeans. In certain states like South Dakota, we're seeing a movement away from planting wheat. They're just hitting soybeans and corn, soybeans and corn. Not good for the soil, not good agriculture, but the reason why they're doing it is it gets them the highest return. 
And that's why the USDA is thinking about taking GMO wheat off the shelf and allowing it to be grown with the thought that it's going to increase yield so the farmer's going to get more dollars per acre so wheat will come back into the rotation again. I don't see any proof why that should happen. It's just hope. Uh, some of these ancient grains, uh, specialty grains, are more expensive because, number one, I've got to convince the grower, okay, that this is something that he has a market for. Um, we were uh, looking at our, our spring variety. We were going to introduce it to a new part of the country. Uh, what we found in that part of the country was uh, they have some grain elevators, but not a lot of grain elevators. Uh, and the elevators, basically, in the breadbasket of the world, you know, uh, Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas, those elevators are set up for commodity crops. So what happens is a farmer grows corn, he can take it right to the grain elevator, or he can take it to his ethanol plant. Uh, if he's growing soybeans, he can take it by the wagon load to the grain elevator and deliver it there. If there is no way for him to deliver a specialty crop, if there is no grain elevator to hold that specialty crop, uh, it could be millet, it could be barley, it could be spelt, it could be emmer. What does he do with it? So what has to happen is somebody like Purity Foods has to go to that farmer and say, look, I've got a specialty crop, I'll take it at harvest. So he's relieved of the burden of trying to figure out where he, what he's going to do with it. He's also relieved of the burden of, how do I sell this? So most of the spelt, most of the amber, most of the einkorn, most of these specialty crops are contracted with growers in order for them to feel comfortable that while they're growing it, it's there and it looks great, but when they harvest it, they've got a place to deliver it to because there is no elevator. The other issue, besides the infrastructure and the lack of infrastructure for specialty crops, is the banker. You know, farmers are probably when they make money, everybody around them makes money. They buy new pickup trucks, they buy new farm equipment. So farmers and the bankers are real close. And a banker, especially if the farm is kind of like not, you know, real substantial, not real, got a lot of foundation behind it, the banker will influence the farmer about the crop that he grows. It's like, why are you growing spelt when you could be growing wheat? Because the banker in the back of his mind goes, where am I gonna sell that spelt if Purity Foods doesn't buy it? He knows that the grain elevator five miles away, if he's growing wheat, he can just take it down there by the truckload and it's gone and he gets paid for it. So there's, outside influences that actually dictate how well we do is being able to secure land and being able to have spelt planted. But when looking for, you know, a whole grain pasta, for instance, if I don't know about spelt and I'm looking at, you know, this bite of spelt whole grain pasta and I'm looking at someone else's just regular, you know, the modern wheat whole grain pasta, what on the back of the box, am I going to notice that's different? What if I switch? A lot of times, the spelt time. Yeah. What, what are the you know the mineral benefits, nutritional benefits? Yeah. You know, is it a more nutritious? What you do is you go to our website, <laughs> and you go to testimonials, and then you go to additional testimonials and click on the testimonial that shows our pasta, because it tells you everything that you really need to know. But one of the one of the keys that you you bring up is a lot of whole grain pastas aren't 100% whole grain. Ours is, uh, in a two ounce serving, ours has 57 grams of uh, whole grain. In other words, in two ounces, there's 57, which is 57 grams. It's 100% whole grain. You put 100 pounds of grain over here, before it goes through the mill, it comes out of the mill, you got 100 pounds of flour. And there is no byproduct that goes somewhere else. A lot of whole grains are only 51% whole grain. 
So they don't have 57 grams in a two ounce serving. The previous owner named the product Vitaspelt, okay? And um, I mean, his intentions were good. Well, it's very literal yeah. what it is. Yeah, it is. But the unfortunate part is people don't know what spelt is. You know, if uh, General Mills had named Wheaties after the Latin name, like this is Triticum Spelta. So if General Mills had named Wheaties using the Latin name, it would be called a Stives, A-E-S-T-I-V-I-E-S. -E -E so that doesn't sound real appetizing. And people in the natural products industry recognize what spelt is, but the regular consumer has no idea. They think we're making it out of fish. So, seriously. So, we were in Canada, and a woman looked at it, and she goes, oh, chocolate pasta. No. <laughs> so, 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 we are in the process of changing the name. It's now called Nature's Legacy for Life. It's more what it really is. This is a product that has been untouched for 8,000 years. You know, man hasn't hybridized it like he has wheat. And so for that reason, some of the problems that we're having as we try to eat food, you ought to try this. The American public has a tendency to look for a silver bullet. And um, there really isn't a silver bullet. Um, the people who are you know, gonna be viewing this Video. Well, if they, there is a silver bullet. I think it's to eat natural foods. You know, we talked about you know like the overconsumption of meat. So I think if there is a silver bullet, it's to eat real food. To but you have to work at it. Yeah. I mean, it's not a silver bullet where you just take it and everything no. is fine. You have to develop an understanding and you have to practice it. Yeah. And that unfortunately is not mm -hmm. uh, what a lot of people want. They just want something that's going to solve their problem, just take the pill and everything's yeah. going to be fine. You know, a lot of how our health care system works is, you know, they don't want you to see like a natural path, they want you to see, you know, an MD diagnose your problems. So, you know, where's, what have they studied, you know, pharmaceuticals, maybe one class in nutrition, maybe not at all. So their answer isn't always food. Their answer is medicine, and you know there's lots of you know like graphics that you might like see on you know on the web or you know like story you hear that you know a health food store you know a co-op is a health food store. It's like if you eat what is found there, if you eat health food, you will be healthy. But instead, people wait until it's too late, until they're sick, and then all of a sudden, it's not going to turn you around in 24 hours to start eating you know healthy. It might turn you around in a matter of weeks. It might turn you around in a matter of months. But instead, they take what the doctors think is for sick people, which is, you know, driven by the pharmaceutical industry. So if everyone was proactive and, you know, took the harder silver bullet to swallow, which, swallow, which is that you need to be eating, you know, natural foods, like, you know, grains that haven't been hybridized, um, not eating highly processed foods, not eating, you know, foods from GMOs. If you eat what nature has, given us, you will be able to practice a healthy lifestyle. You won't, not to say you will never get sick or that you never will have a health problem, but you know, that's the easiest way to take. But a lot of those problems could be as a result of the foods that we eat. Right. You know, if we're constantly getting a runny nose when we eat wheat, and your body is reacting to it every time, you know, um, what you're actually doing is stressing the immune system to the point where it's an autoimmune disease. You you wind up uh, winding up with uh, an autoimmune disease, fibromyalgia, arthritis, that kind of thing. Um, so give your body a break. Pay attention to what it's what it's trying to tell you. Uh, Beth, uh, the gal with the uh, son who's autistic, she says, Spencer, you have a smart body. That's how that's how we figured it out because his body would react and they could figure it out. So that's really kind of what it's about. And you know, it's, it's nice. We, we are not making millions of dollars. We are not getting rich. Um, 
but we're making a decent living and we're helping people where we can.